Before we get into today's episode, I want to let you know about a source of powerful free resources to help you as a parent or grandparent get equipped to invest in the faith of the next generation. Our Next Gen website has been designed to help empower you to navigate tough issues with the young people in your life. At NextGen, you'll find articles, entertainment reviews from a Christian perspective, parenting stories, helpful parenting guides, and even answers to the tough questions. All these resources are free as you engage on the front line of raising the next generation for Jesus. So why not register today at premierinsight.org forward slash resources to receive free resources from NextGen. That's premierinsight.org forward slash resources. And now it's time for today's podcast. Hello, friends. I'm Rick Warren, and welcome to Spurgeon Sermons. This is the official podcast brought to you by Premier and Spurgeon's College. You know, the teachings of Charles Spurgeon have had a personal impact on my life in a profound way, and I'm confident they'll do the same for you. So get ready to be challenged, equipped, and guided by Charles Spurgeon, who is universally regarded as the greatest English preacher in the history of the church. The Dream of Pilate's Wife, a sermon by Charles Spurgeon, part four. When he was sat down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have nothing to do with that just man, for I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 27, verse 19. Thirdly, We have now the lamentable task of observing the frequent failure even of the best means. I have ventured to say that, humanly speaking, it was the best means of reaching Pilate's conscience for his wife to be led to expostulate with him. He would hear but few, but her he would hear. And yet even her warning was in vain. What was the reason? First, self-interest was involved in the matter, and that is a powerful factor. Pilate was afraid of losing his governorship. The Jews would be angry if he did not obey their cruel bidding. They might complain to Tiberius, and he would lose his lucrative position. Alas, such things as these are holding some of you captives to sin. At this moment, you cannot afford to be true and right, for it would cost too much. You know the will of the Lord, you know what is right, but you renounce Christ by putting him off and by abiding in the ways of sin that you may gain the wages thereof. You are afraid that to be a true Christian would involve the loss of a friend's goodwill or the patronage of an ungodly person, or the smile of an influential worldling. And this you cannot afford. You count the cost and reckon that it is too high. You resolve to gain the world even though you lose your soul. What then? You will go to hell rich. A sorry result this. Do you see anything desirable in such an attainment? Oh, that you would consider your ways and listen to the voice of wisdom. The next reason why his wife's appeal was ineffectual was the fact that Pilate was a coward. A man with legions at his back and yet afraid of a Jewish mob. Afraid to let one poor prisoner go whom he knew to be innocent. Afraid because he knew his conduct would not bear inspection. He was morally a coward. Multitudes of people go to hell because they have not the courage to fight their way to heaven. The fearful and unbelieving shall have their portion in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So saith the word of God. 
They are afraid of encountering a fool's laugh and so rush upon everlasting contempt. They could not bear to tear themselves away from old companions and excite remarks and sarcasm among ungodly wits. And so they keep their companions and perish with them. They have not the courage to say no and swim against the stream. They are such cowardly creatures that they will sooner be forever lost than face a little scorn. Yet while there was cowardice in Pilate, there was presumption too. He who was afraid of man and afraid to do right, yet dared to incur the guilt of innocent blood. Oh, the cowardice of Pilate to take water and wash his hands as if he could wash off blood with water and then say, I am innocent of his blood, which was a lie. See ye to it. By those last words, he brought the blood upon himself, for he consigned his prisoner to their tender mercies, and they could not have laid a hand upon him unless he had given them leave. Oh, the daring of Pilate, thus in the sight of God, to commit murder and disclaim it. There is a strange mingling of cowardliness and courage about many men. They are afraid of a man, but not afraid of the eternal God, who can destroy both body and soul in hell. This is why men are not saved, even when the best means are used, because they are presumptuous and dare defy the Lord. Besides this, Pilate was double-minded, he had a heart and a heart. He had a heart after that which was right, for he sought to release Jesus. But he had another heart after that which was gainful, for he would not run the risk of losing his post by incurring the displeasure of the Jews. We have plenty around us who are double-minded. Many men run two ways. They seem earnest about their souls, but they are far more eager after gain or pleasure. Strange perversity of man, that he should tear himself in two. We have heard of tyrants tying men to wild horses and dragging them asunder, but these people do this with themselves. They have too much conscience to neglect the Sabbath and to forgo attendance at the house of prayer. Too much conscience to be utterly irreligious, to be honestly infidel, and yet at the same time they have not enough conscience to keep them from being hypocrites. They let I dare not wait upon I would. They want to do justly, but it would be too costly. They dare not run risks, and yet meanwhile they run the awful risk of being driven forever from the presence of God to the place where hope can never come. Oh, that my words were shot as from a cannon. Oh, that they would hurl a cannon shot at indecision. Oh, that I could speak like God's own thunder, which makes the hinds to carve and breaks the rocks in pieces. Even so would I warn men against these desperate evils, which thwart the efforts of mercy, so that even when the man's own wife, with tenderest love, bids him escape from the wrath to come, he still chooses his own destruction. Lastly, we have a point which is yet more terrible, the overwhelming condemnation of those who thus transgress. This pilot was guilty beyond all excuse. He deliberately and of his own free will condemned the just Son of God to die. Being informed that he was the Son of God and knowing both from his own examination and from his wife that he was a just person. Observe that the message which he received was most distinct. It was suggested by a dream but there is nothing dreamy about it. It is as plain as words can be put. Have nothing to do with that just man, 
for I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. He condemned the Lord with his eyes open, and that is an awful way of sinning. Oh, my dear friends, am I addressing any here who are purposing to do some very sinful thing but have lately received a warning from God? I would add one more caution. I pray you by the blessed God and by the bleeding Saviour, and as you love yourself and as you love her from whom the warning may have come to you, do stop and hold your hand. Do not this abominable thing. You know better. The warning is not put to you in some mysterious and obscure way, but it comes point-blank to you in unmistakable terms. God has sent conscience to you, and he has enlightened that conscience so that it speaks very plain English to you. This morning's discourse stops you on the highway of sin, puts its pistol to your ear and demands that you stand and deliver. Stir an inch, and it will be at your own soul's peril. Do you hear me? Will you regard the heaven-sent expostulation? Oh, that you would stand still a while and hear what God shall speak while he bids you yield yourself to Christ today. It may be now or never with you, as it was with Pilate that day. He had the evil thing which he was about to do fully described to him. And therefore, if he ventured on it, his presumption would be great. His wife had not said, have nothing to do with this man, but with this just man. And that word rang in his ears, and again and again repeated itself till he repeated it too. Read the 24th verse. When he was washing his wicked hands, he said, I am innocent of the blood of this just person, the very name his wife had given to our Lord. The arrows stuck in him. He could not shake them off. Like a wild beast, he had the javelin sticking in his side, and though he rushed into the forest of his sin, it was evidently rankling in him still. That just person haunted him. Sometimes God makes a man see sin as sin and makes him see the darkness of it. And if he then perseveres in it, he becomes doubly guilty and pulls down upon himself a doom intolerable beyond that of Sodom of old. Beside that, Pilate was sinning not only after distinct warning and a warning which set out the blackness of the sin, but he was sinning after his conscience had been touched and moved through his affections. It is a dreadful thing to sin against a mother's prayer. She stands in your way. She stretches out her arms. With tears, she declares that she will block your road to perdition. Will you force your way to ruin over her prostrate form? She kneels, she grasps your knees, she begs you not to be lost. Are you so brutal as to trample on her love? Your little child entreats you. Will you disregard her tears? Alas, she was yours, but death has removed her, and ere she departed, she entreated you to follow her to heaven. And she sang her little hymn. Yes, we'll gather at the river. Will you fling your babe aside as though you were another Herod that would slay the innocents and all in order that you may curse yourself forever and be your own destroyer? It is hard for me to talk to you thus. If it is coming home to any of you, it will be very hard for you to hear it. Indeed, I hope it will be so hard that you will end it by saying I will yield to love which assails me by such tender entreaties. It will not be a piece of mere imagination if I conceive that at the last great day, when Jesus sits upon the judgment seat, 
and Pilate stands there to be judged for the deeds done in the body, that his wife will be a swift witness against him to condemn him. I can imagine that at the last great day there will be many such scenes as that, wherein those who loved us best will bring the most weighty evidences against us if we are still in our sins. I know how it affected me as a lad when my mother, after setting before her children the way of salvation, said to us, If you refuse Christ and perish, I cannot plead in your favour and say that you were ignorant. No, but I must say amen to your condemnation. I could not bear that. Would my mother say amen to my condemnation? And yet, Pilate's wife, what can you do otherwise when all must speak the truth? What can you say but that your husband was tenderly and earnestly warned by you and yet consigned the Saviour to his enemies? O oh, my ungodly hearers, my soul goes out after you. Turn ye, turn ye. Why will ye die? Why will ye sin against the Saviour? God grant you may not reject your own salvation, but may turn to Christ and find eternal redemption in him. Whosoever believeth in him hath everlasting life. Thank you for listening, friends. This podcast was brought to you by Premier in association with Spurgeon's College. For more Christian podcasts, sermons, and music, head back to the website premier.plus and sign in for free. This podcast is an outreach of Premier Insight and it's made possible through the support of listeners like you. And your support today is so vital. We want to thank you for your generous gift by giving you exclusive access to Science, Faith and the Evidence for God Apologetics course. This nine-module course invites you to learn from John Lennox, one of the most celebrated Christian thinkers of our time, through conversations with atheist thinker Michael Ruse and secular talk show host Dave Rubin. You'll be empowered to confidently speak into conversations on faith, science, and why believing in God is not only reasonable, but logical. The course is free to you to thank you for your gift to help Premier Insight equip more Christians to confidently speak into the biggest issues of our culture and defend their Christian faith with conviction and grace. To get access to science, faith, and the evidence for God, simply go to premierinsight.org forward slash Spurgeon. That's premierinsight.org forward slash Spurgeon. Thank you for your support.